Hey everybody. So here we go with the chapter 26 of the Count of Monte Cristo, Roman Bandits. Toward the beginning of the year 1838, two young men belonging to the best society of Paris were staying at Florence. One was Viscount Albert de Moncrief and the other Baron Franz de Epinay. They had decided to spend the carnival together at Rome, and Franz, who had lived in Italy for more than four years, was to be his friend's Cicerone. As it is no small matter to spend the carnival at Rome, especially when you have no great desire to sleep in the Piazza del Popolo or the Campo Facchino, they wrote to Signor Pastrini, the proprietor of the Hotel de Londres, to ask him to reserve a comfortable suite for them. On the Saturday evening before the carnival, they arrived in Rome. The suite reserved for them consisted of two small bedrooms and a sitting room. The bedrooms overlooked the street, a fact which Pastrini com commented was a fact which Pastrini commented upon as a priceless advantage. The remaining rooms on that floor were let to an immensely rich gentleman who was supposed to be either a Sicilian or a Maltese. The proprietor was not quite sure which. That is all very well, Pastrini, said Franz, but we want some supper at once, and also a carriage for tomorrow and the following days. You shall have supper instantly, signore, but for the carriage, we will do all we can to procure one for you, and that is all I can say. Then we shall harness the horses to mine. It is a little worse for the journey, but that doesn't matter. You will not find any horses, said Pastrini. Albert looked at Franz with the expression of a man who had been given an incomprehensible answer. Do you understand that, Franz? No horses. Then surely we can have post horses. They were hired out a month ago, and there are now none left but those absolutely necessary for the postal service. What do you say to that, asked Franz. What I say is that, then it, is that when a thing surpasses my comprehension, I cease to think about it at all. Supper ready, Pastrini? Yes, Excellency. Well then, let us go and have it. But what about the carriage and horses? Make your mind easy about that, my friend. They will come by themselves. It is only a question of price. And with that admirable philosophy, which believes nothing impossible to a full purse and a well-lined pocketbook, Malkoff supped, went to bed, and dreamed he was racing all over Rome in a carriage and six. The next morning, Franz was the first to wake and immediately rang the bell. The tinkling had not yet ceased when mine host appeared. Well, Excellency, he said triumphantly, I was quite right not to promise you anything yesterday. You are too late. There is not a single carriage to be had in Rome, in any case, not for the last three days of the carnival. Well, I don't think much of your eternal city. That is to say, Excellency, there are no more carriages to be had from Sunday morning till Tuesday evening. But until Sunday, you can have 50 if you wish, replied Pastrini, anxious to preserve the dignity of the capital of the Christian world in the eyes of his guests. Huh. That is something, said Albert. Today is Thursday. Who knows what good things will come our way by Sunday? Ten to twelve thousand tippers to make it more difficult than ever, said, was Franz's reply. My friend, let us enjoy the present and give no thought to the evils of the future. I presume we can at least have a window, asked Franz. Where? Overlooking the Corso, naturally. Impossible. Absolutely out of the question, exclaimed Pastrini. There was only one left on the fifth floor of the Doria Palace, and that has been taken by a Russian prince some 20 sequins a day. The two friends looked at each other, astounded. In that case, said Franz to Albert, we had better go to Venice for the carnival. Even if we don't find a carriage there, we shall be sure to find a gondola. No fear, cried Albert. I have made up my mind to see the carnival at Rome, and see it I will, even if I have to go about on stilts. Do your excellency still wish for a carriage until Sunday? What do you think, said Albert? Do you imagine we are going to run about the streets of Rome on foot like lawyers' clerks? I will hasten to execute your excellency's orders, said Pastrini. I will do my best, and I hope you may be satisfied. At what time do you wish the carriage? In an hour. Very well, excellency. In an hour it shall be at the door. When Albert and Franz descended an hour later, the carriage was there. Where do your excellencies wish to go, asked the Cicerone. To St. Peter's, of course, and then to the Colosseum, said Albert. Albert did not know, however, that it takes a day to see St. Peter's and a month to study it. Suddenly, the two friends noticed that the day was drawing to a close. Franz took out his watch. It was half past four. 
They immediately returned to the hotel. At the door, Franz ordered the coachman to be ready again at eight. He wanted to show Albert the Colosseum by moonlight, as he had seen St. Peter's by daylight. They were to leave by the Porta del Popolo, follow the outer walls, and return by the Porta San Giovanni. When they had finished their dinner, the innkeeper appeared before them. I hear, he said, that you have ordered the carriage for nine o'clock and that you propose visiting the Colosseum. You have heard aright. Is it also true that you intend to start from the Porta del Popolo, then to follow the outer walls and return by Porta San Giovanni? Those were my very words. Your itinerary is impossible, or to say the least, very dangerous. Dangerous? Why? Because of the bandit, Luigi Bampa. Pack up your ears, Albert. Here's a bandit for you at last. Well, and what has that to do with my orders to the coachman to leave by the Porta del Popolo and return by Porta San Giovanni? Simply that you may leave by the one, but I very much doubt whether you will return by the other, and because as soon as night falls, not one safe 50 yards from the gate. One is not safe 50 yards from the gates. Here's a great adventure for us, old man, said Albert, turning to Franz. We will fill our carriage with pistols, blunderbusses, and double-barreled guns. Instead of Luigi Bampa holding us up, we will hold him up. We will take him to Rome and present him to His Holiness the Pope, who will ask us what recompense we desire for such great service. We will, shall merely ask for a carriage and pair. Then we shall have a carriage for the carnival, and, what is more, the Roman people will, in all probability, give expression to their gratitude by cramming us in the capital and proclaiming us the saviors of their country. Your Excellency knows that, that it is not customary to defend oneself when attacked by bandits. What? cried Albert, whose courage revolted at the idea of letting himself be robbed without making any resistance. It is not customary, did you say? No, for it would be useless. What would you do against a dozen bandits suddenly springing out at you from a ditch or a, a rum or an aqueduct with their guns leveled at your head? Albert poured himself a glass of Lacrima Christi, which he drank in sips, muttering unintelligibly to himself all the time. Well, Signor Pastrini, said Franz, now that my companion has cooled down and you can appreciate our peaceful intentions, tell us who is this Luigi, who this Luigi Bampa is? Is he a shepherd or a nobleman? Is he young or old, tall or short? Describe him to us so that if by any chance we should meet him, we shall recognize him. I knew Luigi Bampa when he was a mere boy. He was a shepherd on a farm belonging to the Count de Saint Felice. He is now about 22 years of age and is of a medium height. With hardly more than a youth, he killed the captain of a gang of bandits and himself became their captain. I fell into his hands once going from Ferentino to Alatri. Al Luckily for me, he remembered me and not only set me free without making me pay a ransom, but also made me a present of a beautiful watch. What do you think of Luigi Bampa now, old man, said Franz, turning to his friend. I say that he is a myth and that he has never existed. Do you say he still carries on his business in the outskirts of Rome? Yes, and with a boldness unquelled by any before him. And what is his procedure in regard to foreigners? Oh, that is quite simple. According to the distance from the town, he gives them eight, twelve, or twenty-four hours wherein to pay their ransom. After this time has elapsed, he grants an hour's grace. If he has not received the money by the sixteenth minute of that hour, he blows out his prisoner's brains with one shot, or thrusts the dagger into his heart, and the matter is ended. What do you think about it? Franz asked his companion. Are you still inclined to go to the Colosseum by the outer boulevards? Certainly, if the route is picturesque, was the reply. Nine o'clock struck, and the door opened to admit the coachman. Excellency, said he, your carriage is waiting. To the Colosseum, then, said Franz. By the Porta del Popolo, your excellencies, or through the streets? Through the streets, most certainly, through the streets, cried Franz. Really, my dear friend, I thought you were braver than that, said Albert, raising and lighting his third cigar. The two young men went down the stairs and entered the carriage. Shenanigans are afoot. I'll see you guys next time.